As I look around this morning, I see a whole lot of people that have been backed into a corner. And each one of you have your own corner that you've been backed into. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe it's fear, sickness, doubt. Not real sure what it may be, but everybody has that. And, it, and, and let's be honest, it gets pretty frustrating, doesn't it? And we look at what's getting ready to happen in the future and we know that the church is getting ready to get back into a corner. And we're going to find out in the few days coming who is real and who is not. A lot of people could talk the talk and talk all kinds of trash about how spiritual they are. But when they get backed into a corner, a lot of people run and hide or give in. That's not God's way, but we're getting ready to find out and God's going to sift the church over the, the next few years. And He's going to purge it and He's going to purify it. And those that are real are going to get stronger. And you're going to see some people just fade on into the sunset because they would rather not struggle against evil. They'd rather just sit there. Somebody asked B.R. Lakin one time, what have I got to do to go to hell? He said, absolutely nothing. Just sit right where you are. <laughs> so we're, gonna, we're, we're getting ready to face the struggle of our lives in the days to come. We really are. And it's a matter of who are we going to allow to take the reins of our life? Like Mike said, we're all tempted to jump up and get up in the middle of everything. And God may call some of us to do that. But we need to remember whose battle it really is and who this is really against. And so in the coming days, we're going to have to trust God more than we ever have. I think God has already been getting a lot of us ready for it because many of us are spending more time in prayer than we ever have in our life. Just when you've been praying for a brother or sister in the church and it looks like things are turning around for them, boom, somebody over here, something's wrong with them and it's urgent. And we have to stay deep in prayer all the time for them. But I'm telling, and, and we're even starting new prayer chains and, 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 and new live stream prayer meetings everywhere. But it's working. And that's the way God grows you. Amen. That's how you get stronger. So I'm glad to see that. But we need to learn to hand it over to Him our battles after we have done all. The Bible says, I'm not real sure where I'm going with this, but I'm going to tell it like the Lord lays it on my heart. He says in the New Testament to do this and to do that, and then after having done all, to stand. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it's important that we learn how to stand. And that's really, really hard for me. All of the, the, the songs, all of the verses, all the testimonies this morning kind of blowed me away because nobody knew what I was going to read and what I was going to do. And they all went right along with it. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 14 if you want to follow along in your Bibles. The children of Israel had been brought out of Egypt by what the Bible called a high hand. They saw all of the incredible things that God did to get them out of slavery. And now they're going out into the wilderness and they've escaped. And a lot of us are like that right now. God brought you out of a hole. He brought you out of a pit. He pulled you out of slavery and allowed you to escape. And you have forgotten what he did for you sometimes and you're getting to where you don't trust him again and something has to happen in your life to where you have nothing else to trust but him and he'll do that so you will start trusting him again see understand this God wants us to trust him 
totally believe on him and totally trust him. And when we allow the things of the world to cloud our mind, he will bring along an incident that will cause you to call back out for him again. And we're looking at that right now on a personal level and also on a corporate level as a, as a church and even as a nation. And we need to understand why these things are going on and God wants us to trust him. We've got to get rid of plan A, B, and C and let him be it. When God is all you have, God is all you need. He wants you to understand that. So here are the children of Israel. They've gotten out of Egypt. 400 years of slavery and now they were free. They were hidden out into the wilderness. But God wasn't done with them yet and he's not done with you yet either. Because saving you is just the very beginning. He wants you to grow. He wants you to become powerful for Him. He wants you to do mighty things for Him. But you can't do any of that unless you trust Him. It's scary. I'll admit that. But that's when He does His best work. When you're in a corner. When you have no other place to go. So the Lord spoke to Moses. He said, speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth between Migdal and the sea over against Beelzephon before it shall you encamp by the sea. God had a plan of what he wanted to do with them and seemingly he gave them awful directions. If you read the whole thing it looks like it. They should have gone out the other way. But God doesn't work like that. He will send you somewhere where you wind up in a corner and you have no other alternative but to call on him. He does that because he wants you to see what he can do and he wants you to trust him. Then he told Moses this, he said, for Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. And that's the way the world looks at us. Some of them are gloating this morning and said, I got them now where I want them. They have. The forces of evil is stupid enough a lot of times to think they got you. And the only time that they really do is when you think they have. Don't be fooled. Then he said, I'll do this. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart that he'll follow after them and I'll be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all the hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so. Now all of my Calvinist friends like to say, uh-huh, look at that. He controlled all of that. He made Pharaoh do that. Blah, blah, blah. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh, hold on a minute. Pharaoh made his choice a long time before that, when he looked at Moses and said, I don't know your God. I don't want to know your God. When he said that, then that's when his heart got hardened. That's when he was in the hands of God because of the choices that he had made. It wasn't that Pharaoh couldn't help it. I'll just give you a little theological lesson there and we'll move on. <clears throat> what God does at times is allow these hard times to come along, these rough things to happen in our life, to where the devil even seemingly has the upper hand, and he looks like he's in control, because when God's hammer drops, <clears throat> he's going to get honor out of all this. He fixes it in a way that we can't. You understand what I'm saying? If you can see your way out of your problem right now, that's not faith. That's not God. That's you. But he does it in such a way that we have no other alternative than to let him take care of us. And he said, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? Why have we let Israel go from serving us? He was so evil, he had forgotten that God went through and took out all the firstborn and got them in su such an uproar. He said, get out of here and just take your people with you. 
But the devil is ignorant. I want you to understand that. He's not all-knowing. He's not all-powerful. And the devil does a lot of stupid things. Have you ever wondered why you do stupid things? Because you listen to him. Now, he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and then all the other chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. They're going after them. They're getting all those thousands of chariots and horses and soldiers and all that. And they're going against the children of Israel, which was about a million from what I understand. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Again, they're going to forget the deliverance that they got. And so often we do too. We forgot what God has done for us. We forgot what the, the awful things that God saved us from. And now a little problem comes along and we're going to fold up. We can't do it. But the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, they overtook them in camping by the sea. Got them there. They were coming out of the wilderness. They were right by the Red Sea. There was nowhere to go. There was water on this side and Pharaoh's army on the other. Boy, what a predicament. But God sometimes allows your predicament so you will trust him. I'm going to say that over and over until it sinks in all of our hard heads this morning. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And just like a good bunch of Baptists, they were sore afraid. They need to start a new church called the Sore Afraid Baptist Church. <laughs> I have never seen, you know, the Baptists now, I'm a Pentecostal Baptist. If you don't like that, we'll see you later. I'm sorry. I'm so messed up theologically. I believe all the Bible. I believe all of it. I practice all of it. So it is what it is. But I've seen, but the, the Baptist church historically has always made a stand on the word of God, has always made a stand on trust in God and, and doing this and doing that. And this here lately, I've never seen so many little spineless hand wringing pastors in all of my life. Amen. What in the world is wrong with them? They are preaching more about obeying the government than obeying the word of God. And the least little thing, they close the churches and then everybody wonders why ain't nobody getting saved. Lord, have mercy. I could see the founding fathers now writing the Constitution and saying this will all be true no matter what until we get a little bit of a virus and then it's all gone. Churches back then lived under fear of being burned to the ground and raided and killed and, and all of that. And they met. They laid their rifles up against the wall, but they met. Y'all want to lay y'all's up against the thing? That's all right. But this is not a time to run. This is not a time to be afraid. This is a time to grow a spine and make a stand for God. But here was a typical church member. They were so afraid and the children cried out unto the Lord. After they get done crying out to the Lord, then they blame the pastor. Oh yes, it's all the pastor's fault. Like I've said before, I prepare to take full responsibility for all the <laughs> ills of the world. Tack it on me, I'm guilty, I did it. They said to Moses, listen to this, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us to die in this wilderness? Lord, have mercy. They forgot what God pulled them out of. And poor old Moses had to remind them again of the miracles that God did 
to rescue them? Do you think for one moment that God is going to save your soul and pull you out of a life headed for hell and then just forget you and walk away? That's a mighty pitiful God if he does that. Does he not have the strength to sustain you after he has saved you? Of course he can. And they asked him, they said, why have you deal, dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? And then they said, is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying leave us alone? That we may serve the Egyptians? Boy, that would have been better now because there's a lot of pastors that would be glad to leave you alone and let you serve the devil rather than make waves. They would rather do that. Rather make you smile and be happy going to hell than to try to tell you what the truth is to keep you out of it. Said, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we, than that we should die in the wilderness. I disagree with that. I would rather die in the wilderness on my feet than on my knees before the devil. Amen. I would much rather die that way. Let's look at it this way, people. We're all going to die one day. Whether you like it or not, unless the Lord comes and, and raptures the church out sometime soon. And I wish you'd hurry up because I'm 64 now. But anyway, if not, we're all going to die. How you die is up to you. Do you want to die free and saved or you want to die as a slave to the devil? That's your choice and that was their choice. And all they wanted to do was whine. Thank God Moses didn't listen to them. Moses said unto them, and this is what I say to everybody here, everybody watching from home, everybody on TV, everybody on radio, everybody on Facebook, and let's not leave out YouTube. It's a good thing they didn't have all that then or Moses would have been wore out. <laughs> Moses said to the people, Fear ye not and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will show us today. He will show you today. And I'm telling you, no matter what corner you are in this morning, stand still like the girls sang and see the salvation of the Lord. He is able people he's able he said for the Egyptians whom you see today you shall see them again no more forever God can deliver you for whatever mess you're in this morning and he will if you will trust him and this is my favorite. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Mm. Now if the King James translators had only said the Lord shall fight for you and deleted the rest of that verse, I'd be a whole lot more comfortable. Anybody that knows me knows I've always had trouble holding my peace. I'm not going to lie about it. Everybody knows most of my faults anyway. And if there's a few more you want to know, just ask her. She's been with me 36 years. If I haven't, that's one godly woman right there. If she hasn't run screaming into the woods many years ago, never to be seen again, she's a powerful godly woman. That's all I can say. We all want to get that last word in. And we thank God for Facebook so we can. We could go to bed at night knowing we have riled up half of the country right before we shut the computer off. Yeah. We got that last word in and we didn't look to see what they replied because we didn't want to hear it. <laughs> but that's what he said. He said, shut up. He said, the Lord shall fight for you and you will shut up. Oh, dear Lord, that is the hardest thing, but we need to learn that. Because when God deals with something, oh, he does it so much better. When God does something, it's memorable. And everybody knows that it was God that did it. So the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying to me? That's what he said. Speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. 
A lot of pastors this morning, oh Lord, I got some crazy people in my church. What am I supposed to do with them? They're all panicking and freaking out and they're doing this and they're doing that. What am I supposed to do with them? And, he, and God is saying, why are you crying to me? You need to speak to them. Amen. That they go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. I love that. He does the impossible. And if y'all will just hang on a minute and just say, Lord, you got this. You handle this. You're going to watch the waters part. Don't jump in the Red Sea and try to swim. Stand there and let him handle it. Oh, I know that's hard to do. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they'll follow after them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh. I love that. And all of his host and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. That's what God wants to do. He wants to get the honor out of all this mess that we're in. But we've got to let him do it his way. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. So now he's back there. It's up to us. Let's do this. Let's do what he commands. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light um, by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night. The angel stood between Egypt and Israel and blocked it and protected them to give them time to go do what God told them to do. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. By the way, the Washington Post said that's easy to explain. Washington compost, I'm sorry. And it said it made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. There ain't no other way to explain your way out of that one but God. When God makes his move, there is no scientific explanation for none of it. God defies the scientific explanations. And we've been watching that lately. And we've been watching the smirk come off the face of many people that are naysayers against that. And the children of Israel went in the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. The waters were a wall on the right and the left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Archaeologists have been kind of pilfering around at the bottom of the Red Sea over the last few years. And it's kind of odd that there's some chariot wheels down there at the bottom of it, but that's another story. And it came to pass in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and he troubled the host of the Egyptians and he took off their wheels and he drove them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians and that's what God wants to do with your life. He wants the devil to say we need to run because God is fighting for them. That's the whole bottom line. And we've got to trust him. The things that God says here are outrageous. They're impossible. But that's when he does his best work. Listen to the outrageous that God is telling you. Dare to trust him. Dare to pray and ask for things that the doctor says you can't have. Dare to do it. Dare to, to believe the things that everybody, including people that love you, said it cannot happen for you. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters come upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appears, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the middle of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, and there remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and on the left. And the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work that God wants to do for you. That great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Some idiot told a pastor one time that the Red Sea was only six inches deep where the children of Israel crossed. And he got to shouting and praising God and said, my Lord, that's an even bigger miracle. And they said, how's that? He said, because the entire Egyptian army drowned in six inches of water. Oh, don't ever pay any attention to the idiots that want to come and give you a commentary on something like that. It was a clear miracle of deliverance. And so this morning, I want you to understand that whatever corner you are backed into, whatever you are facing, I know this is hard, and I know this is tough, but praise God for it because he's getting ready to deliver you. He's getting ready to do something really awesome in your life. If you will step out of the way, shut up and trust him. That's right. I know that's plain English, but that's the way it is. And I know we're prideful and we think we can handle this and we can handle that. Don't ever tell God you can handle something because then he's going to give you something you can't handle where you have to trust him. He's been working even in my life. I've been saved since June of 1969. And he's still working on me, so I know he's still working on y'all too. Trust him and learn from all of the things that's going on and do not be afraid. Oh, look, look, turn the news off.